The enemy's not going to rob us and rob you just because others are talking about it every week. But we're going to receive what this Bible says, what this truth says. The enemy's not going to steal from us. He's not going to devour us. He's not going to make us afraid of speaking about his, God's prosperity and God's blessings. Period. Period. So, that was for the devil. And hopefully... And you know, some people get a little breakthrough in their finances because they give the minimum of 10%. They're being legalistic. Only obeying that one part. But there's more parts in the Bible about giving. Like the Pharisees. God had their pockets, but not their hearts. Some people are extremely blessed because they want... They went from giving 10 to now they're reaching 100%. These ones are exceeding the righteous of the Pharisees. God has their hearts and their pockets. And how do you say, how does your pocket have to do with your heart? Well, whatever's your idol, you cannot serve God and man, and you cannot serve money, and you can't serve God, and you can't hold on to that which God tells you to release because you're living in fear. You either have faith or fear. You either have faith that the Word works for you as well as everyone that it worked for in the Bible, or you're just, or you're just an unbeliever. An unbeliever, what? Doesn't believe the Word. They just go to church, and they never receive nothing, and they're double-minded because they always work out their own, their own way, their own mindset. They exalt their ways, their thoughts, their emotions, above the Word of God. So we have to get our thoughts, our emotions, and our way under the Word of God where so we can receive the blessing. And if God has me speaking about this today, it's for a reason. It's okay when we're speaking about someone else. So some of you in here need to repent. And probably many people that will end up watching this in time to come need to repent. Not because God needs your money. He needs your heart. And you cannot serve both. I could have spent another hour downloading scriptures about finances and money. I couldn't believe it when God started down pouring scripture into my heart and I was looking it up for the for this message. But I'm like, my goodness, we could do a whole no wonder they have a ten weeks series on prosperity because it's all in the Bible. But you know, we want to keep things balanced because it's funny the people that have, are greedy, they don't want to talk about money, but um, you know, well, so what are we going to talk about this week? So then we'll talk about your unbelief. No matter what, you're going to get hit by the Holy Ghost, no matter what it is, if you're not living righteously by God. So, if we talk about this, then this people are going to get upset. No matter what, this word is to separate us from ourselves in the world, to get us under His blessing and walk in His truth and righteousness because He wants to do more than we can ask or think of. That's what His Word says. Let's see what else His Word says. Because we have people on Facebook all over giving, coming against ministers. And guarantee this, most of them probably aren't being righteous with all of the... But let God judge that. Don't come against the truth. But we need to not follow their pernicious and devious ways. But so be it that we're going to um, my goodness, not speak about what's in the Bible because other people are using it unrighteously. That would be that would be totally ignorant of us and stupid. This is for the people right now that have a problem with because it keeps ministers from preaching about the truth. And if it's in the Bible, then we need to preach about it. If it wasn't in here, then it'd be a heresy and a doctrine of devils, but it's all in here and we'll see. So, we want to get in connection with God's heart. Greedy people hate when money is discussed in the church because they like all things to fall under the weight of the conviction of their sin. Satan would love us to ignore this crucial aspect of the kingdom and keep us bound under the slavery of the world that was created by the world for the world. Sad that most church people also submit to the world and its ways. 
The Bible says, what you sow, ever man, whatever a man sows, whatsoever a man so ever a man, whatsoever so, because I couldn't, I couldn't find the word, so, so I got so as ever, and is there a word so ever? Because it isn't S O E E V E R, so I saw S O W and that was spaced out, so that's how I copy and paste it. But we're talking about sowing and reaping, so it's kind of. So ever a man thinks he will be. So if you think you're poor, you're poor. If you think you're blessed, you'll be blessed. And the world is catching all these things in the new, um, you know, you know, name and acclaim and think these things, look at it, believe it, because it's a concept of your mind, how your mind works, and how faith actually operates. And But God operates by faith in everything that he does. So if you don't believe what the Word says, you don't have faith in it, then you don't receive its things. So how can we do all the things that God's called us to do if we just neglect the one thing that we're going to need to to finance the things? And it's so funny when God, but the world, how the world persecutes the church when the church gets blessed, but nobody says anything when the world's blessed. And even um, was brought to my attention that by somebody else that got it from somebody else, the things that the world does and gets, and nobody says a thing about it. But the minute, the minute God blesses one of His children, what happens? The enemy starts speaking to the world, everyone, and, and because He wants you not to have what God wants you to have, and the church isn't gonna speak against anything because we know better that they're in the world and that's what their God and stuff is so we're not going to sit there and persecute them for being what they're created not created to be but fallen in the, in the fall of man and, and, and sinners sin and whatever so what, we waste our time trying to tell them why do you have all these eyes we need to get them saved so then we can get into the kingdom what Satan does and it gets us you know Jesus even said I became poor that you might be rich. Well, just because he did something didn't make in any way, he, whatever he did, he chose to do it. But he had the power from heaven to recreate anything. He put gold in the fish's mouth. He just was strained from what he was capable and able to do. Yeah, but he had everything in his sufficient need, what he needed to accomplish. So what are you saying? He didn't need a home because he was a traveling minister. He didn't need a place to lay his head because... So when he was saying that to, the, to, to his disciples, he was saying, I got no home. I'm not, you're not going to go and have a nice big house that you know when you want me. You won't even have a place, a solitary place where you can call home. Are you ready for this? Because we're in different times than we are now. So, and Jesus basically said, you know, but everything he had need of, because what? He had, uh, Judas had the money bag. And the money bag was always full. And the Bible also says, God will give, um, it says in I think Ephesians or that, um, is all in His riches and glory, all of our needs according to His riches and glory, those that are in Christ. And that's funny, people think it's because I'm in the church. That, and that's the, the, the scripture out of contact. We say all these things, but it says those that are in Christ Jesus. And how do we stay in Christ Jesus? The robe of righteousness that God puts on us makes us in Him. So Jesus, we put on Jesus and we're living righteously. And then we're in Christ. So basically, you can't just take a scripture and apply it to your life if you're not doing all the things that the Word, and that's what's going on in the church today, and doing and living by the things that the Word says. It's called stupidity, and it's called um, ignorance, and it's called... Um, there's a way that seemed right to a man, but in the end brought forth death. There's a way that seemed right to Christians, but they're living in poverty. Because they're, li they're grabbing scriptures out of context and trying to apply them to their life. I see it everywhere. And ministers aren't correcting them because they're wanting to be traveling and getting from them. So they go up and they give something, but not knowing that they probably won't receive it because they're doing it out of need, out of covetousness or out of um, necessity or they're doing it out of 
being witchcraft from the minister. Although God blesses a few here and there, and then you get the testimony because God sees that they didn't know any better and He wants to stand by His word. So you got to know all of this stuff. And then all those people that uh, always uh, complain about finances are the ones that if you ask them about their finances, they, they have no testimonies because they don't give because it was it's under the law. So basically... There's a little bit of a problem for those that preach half the gospel, but for us, there's a true blessing. And those that are tapping in um, are understanding what the kingdom is all about. The Bible says God's name is the same and never changes. It says God's ways are the, His ways, God's ways never change. And it says God is the same, and the Bible says it's the same yesterday today and even tomorrow. So when Jesus, when they wrote that, Jesus wasn't yet on the cross. So he didn't change just because he sent his son. He's the same. We have more opportunity, but actually we have, we're a more of a, we're, we're expected to do so much more now that Jesus died on the cross for us because he gave us the power to do it. And every man in the old could fail and God expected them to. But now we have the power for transfiguration. We have the power for transformation. We have the power living in us to become the sons of God, the sons of righteousness. So we have no excuse. Unless you think you're saved and you don't have the Holy Spirit and you don't know anything anyway, so hopefully God moves and you get saved. But if you are saved, and you are rebellious, the Bible says that the rebellious dwell in a dry and thirsty land. A dry and thirsty land. Everybody say, dry and thirsty. Dry and thirsty. This meaning, what moved him before him will move him now. So God said, well, look what moved me. If you really want to tap into me, See what moved me in the Old Testament and also moved me in the New Testament. Because I'm the same God yesterday, today, and forever. It's not a, I'm not a magician where I'm a prophet and I can tell you, unless God sets it up, which is few and far between, but it's not every time you visit a church. There's, there's times in the Bible where God did send a prophet and did expect the person to do what the prophet says. But God's done that to me once or twice or maybe three times in my life and I and the people that had done it had received their or it was just in a different way but it wasn't something about me it was mostly for them to do something in their life so let's see what the Bible says because we're so hungry for more of the truth we're not under the law but we're actually harder covenant now why how do you ask well, the Old Covenant, God wanted part. The New, He wants it all. All of our heart and all that is within us. Everybody say all. All. Oh. Right? So in the Old, it was impossible for it to be perfect, and nobody did it. But in the New Covenant, we have His grace. And His grace empowers us to become the sons of righteousness. His grace enables us to become perfect. Because in Matthew 5... 48, it speaks about be a perfect, for I am perfect. Oh, brother, don't, don't preach about that, because, you know, we all, you know, we all fall short, or we all, you know, we all, yeah. But, God says we can be perfect. So if we expect anything else, we have unbelief. So let's see here. Imperfection is nothing lacking, nothing missing. In the kingdom, you either have a kingdom mind or you're double-minded and you have a worldly mind. And you need to repent. God says you're a double-minded man or a woman. You have faith that God can do what He says, not by our, our strength of our own capabilities, our own... See, we're so embedded. That's why, I, you know... Um, Somebody posted something real, really good, and it was like more like.
some people go through college and other people go through the fire. So some people get renewed in their mind and some people get worldly minded. And if you're in the kingdom, you don't have to go to college to become successful and rich. You've been deceived. And then they make you slaves. And then they say, then you get in debt with them. And then you're under the government your whole life. Right. Unless God breaks and does a miracle for you. And then a preacher comes and tells you something and then you get mad at him. But Jesus says it all in His Word. So let's look at what God's Word says. You know what? They take up offerings to sin in, 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 in denominations throughout the world. They take offerings to help send kids to college. That's crazy. Or to get the down payment for the loan that they're going to get. Or to get... I don't know, man. Jesus didn't say, come follow me, and once you, you know, graduate college, then you'll really be ready to come serve in the kingdom. We've been so Americanized, so nationalized, so um, brainwashed, and that's why God says when we get the word, we renew our minds. And that's the problem. That we're not, the church is not having a renewed mind, so they still think like the world, act like the world, and are still poor like the world. Because the devil sure is not going to, to help you out. And God can help you because you have a lack of knowledge. And the Bible says, my children perish for lack of knowledge. They don't receive, they die. They don't receive spiritual things because they know not what to believe. And the devil's working overtime extensively on the side of all of us, speaking in the left side or the right side or in our minds, making us think, like the world, trying to make things happen in the flesh. But the God says the flesh profits you nothing. Profits you nothing. So what do you mean? I can just... Yeah, and it's going to cause a lot of persecution when you do get blessed. Do nothing. And just believe. There's times in the Bible, yeah, nothing. But there's many times God expects us to do things according to His righteousness according to what God says. So what? Everything is on His terms. We always want to make things on our terms and then expect God and we go every day and then go on Facebook and see the poster. If you believe God's going to bless you today, type Amen. And, and stupidly you do it and all day you're waiting to look for a blessing. And the blessing... And then somebody... You find a dollar on the floor and you think it was from God because you typed Amen or whatever might happen. It's not about typing something, it's about righteousness. He promises His Word is faithful and He will accomplish His Word. And His Word will not return void and it shall wherever it's sent to be. And the Word of the Lord will last forever, but we will not. So these bodies are perishing, so His Word lasts forever. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Oh my goodness, now that, that truth preacher, oh, now he's talking about money. Oh, I'm going to lose some, because people are so narrow-minded, they get so stuck in getting mad at the church or mad at somebody about one area, and they shut them, their own self, the devil tricks you and you shut your own life off to the blessing of God. Let's look what the Word of God says. And it's funny that the devil... Will not hold us back. What we preach, we believe, and what we believe, we shall have, with pure motives and a pure heart. So many haters out there are are so critical, but it is God wants us to have money and blessings and wealth. Then there's a reason for it, and don't think the reason isn't part of them isn't to to for you. Because if you do that, then you'll never be able to receive. But in your receiving, you will be taken care of overwhelmingly and others will be blessed even more. And the kingdom will be manifested in the earth. So we see 
The devil is a liar. Some people spend their days trying to curse the church and cause some ministers, just because ministers are greedy, doesn't cause he to stop or separate him from his word. Let's see what God says about giving and receiving. And let's believe him. So, I'm going to go over seven areas really fast. Well, I don't know. So, if God never changes, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Well, let's look in the Bible what happened and what moved him. And let's not even talk about, you know, when, uh, let's not even talk about it. It was probably a, it was probably an offering that was taken and Ananias and Sapphira spoke to the Holy Spirit and then later the enemy came and said, oh, you can't do that. You can't, knowing they're going to lose the money. And then held back half and ended up dropping dead. Let's not talk about that stuff. I'm just going to talk about you know, the stuff, some simple stuff about blessing here. Because, you know, God's not serious about finances because He wouldn't just kill someone for robbing the church and, his, and, and the whole couple because he, he had a perfect, wanted a perfect church and He had to pluck out the, cut off the, the right hand offending, cut it off and let the whole church get offended and cast into hell. So God had to cut some things off. And God wants to cut some things off in your life, my life, and all of our lives, and in the church. So, we haven't talked about this in almost a year. Well, we, oh, some would say, well, you talked about 10 minutes. Well, we're going to talk longer than that today. Luke 6, 38 says, Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure. And a lot of you, a lot of people say, well, I got everything that I need. That's pride. I got everything that I need, everything that I want, and that's just pride. Because how can you have everything you need and then you're not able to bless or help out the poor or help out somebody else that's in need? So when you have everything else, you're just selfish because you're still just thinking about yourself. And God says, no, it's all about my kingdom and blessing other people and um, and in these seven areas, you're going to see what moves God so He can do that. No matter what all the ministers out there do and do wrongly and move and be greedy, God's going to break you free in your mind so you can actually be blessed, so you can be a blessing to others and, and, and advance His kingdom on this earth. Take finances to do that. First time we talk about money a year, just to catch up. Don't think he walks in the church and we're talking about money for the... <laughs> that's how the enemy would live. oh man I walked that church and I'm, yeah, just like all the rest of them talking about money so I just shut the enemy's voice off right now for later to come or whatever in the mighty name of Jesus so let's see how God operates in that area he said give and it shall be given unto you good measure pressed down shaken together running over shall men give into your bosom for the same measure you meet it shall be measured to you again so now he's talking about men giving to you, so whatever you get, it's more blessed. Some people think and wait, but it's just more blessed. So what is God really saying here? He says, forget about thinking about getting, just give. Give your heart, give your time, give your finances. Whatever you need to give, give it, and that is where you'll be blessed. Many of you say, well, I'm giving because I want to be blessed. And you're already counting yourself out of it. So let's see one area here, and seven areas here. In the tithe, bring all of your tithe to the storehouse where there's meat in my house. Prove me, says the Lord, and I'll open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing so that there shall be room enough to receive it. And I'll rebuke the devourer, and thou shalt destroy it. Who comes to destroy the fruits of your ground? Who comes because you have five jobs uh, every year, five different jobs, then what happens? That stops happening. You get secure in place and God starts because you're thinking about Him first. Your vats and your fruit shall not in the field of So well, that's Old Testament. So let's see about that. And the Lord of hosts shall, and the nations shall call you blessed. The nations shall call you blessed. And every nation we go to, they call us blessed. And that means we're blessed. And that's good. Because God blesses His obedient. 
And then we have the offering. Well, the man robbed God, he bribed him tithes and offerings, you're cursed with a curse. Every man according to his purpose in his heart. Um, to give cheerfully, not grudgingly, not necessity, but God loves a cheerful giver. So right there it talks about offerings. Offering is everything you do after you do what God commands you to do. So it's like this. You're in the kingdom of God, and God is the IRS, and He says, whatever I give you, then this is what I expect back from you for my kingdom, to advance my kingdom, to feed the poor, to clothe the naked, to go and do what I've called to do. Because how many know that most of us are selfish, we're self-centered, and it's not about His kingdom, it's not about other people, it's usually about us, and that's what the kingdom of God and the Word of God comes to set us apart from ourselves. So basically, to start to break that altar of our own, we have an altar, an idol of our life, and we have to start to break that, we need to give in obedience. So we see here, and then in the, where, where when we give, we break it. And then whatever we do after that, 20 here, 30 there, go pay for somebody's utility bill, whatever, that's an offering unto the Lord, and also unto an alms offering, which I'm going to come into later. But it's an offering. When you give for something that is in need of the church above what you're... But every, most, most people don't even do the first one, and all they do is the second one, knowing that the second one, they never have any seed in the ground because you're out of, you already have the IRS after you that you're not doing it rightfully, so you're really just throwing water, bread on the water, but it never comes back to you because you're not, you don't have, God doesn't have your full heart. First of all, you're, you become your own God. You decide how many times when you don't feel like giving, come on. Even when you know you got to do it, you already struggle with it. You think you're going to hear clearly from God every time He wants you to do something? What if it's that time of the month and you, you have a bill that's needed? Well, first of all, the reason you're in that situation probably is because you're not in the kingdom. In the kingdom, what? There's no lack. Yes. So in the kingdom, everybody's blessed. From the low to the high. From the east to the west. So let's see here what God says about the first cruise. It says, and probably says in Ezekiel 44, 38 as well. See, the first fruit, all, every obligation of all, every sort of your obligation shall be the priest. You shall give unto the priest the first of your dough. It's funny they use dough, D-O-U. <laughs> the first of your dough, that he may cause a blessing to rest in your house. And we know in Proverbs 3, it costs about bring your first fruits of all your thine increase to the Lord. That your your vats will overflow and your verse with new wine and all this. So there's always a something for comes after the obedience. You say, well, we're under the law. I don't have to do something unless you're right, but you're wrong. And I'll show you why. How can I be right and wrong? Because it's how you look at it. If you look at something in a wrong way, you might even be right, but God's not going to move on you because it's all about your heart. So. We see that there, and we also see it there. So, what is first fruits of all increase? Okay, I live on a salary. First of all, you're already given the first of every month to him, so that's a tithe or every week or whenever God increases you. And if you're a farmer, it would be your crops. And now, an and increase also is you get a, a yearly raise of of a hundred dollars. The whole hundred, the first time you get it, should go to the Lord. Now, let's see about the alms to the poor. Now let's go into the New Testament. Say, well, that's Old Testament. Well, let's look at your alms to the poor. Matthew 6, 1 through 4. Take heed, you do not do your alms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise, you have your reward of your Father who is in heaven. Therefore, when thou thine alms, don't sound the trumpet like the hypocrites do in the synagogues, in the streets, that's why we don't say, oh, we just gave away 48 pairs of this or that, because we used to do that, but the religion always says, oh yeah, we prayed this, we're going out and giving flowers, we're doing this. You know, there's it's like a fine line. Really, it's all pride, because we want to, look what we're doing. And God's like, good, they're seeing what you're doing, but I don't see it anymore. So it's not that we have a need now, we need this, there's a fine line, you got to be careful. It's all about the heart. But if we already have it, what do I got to tell everybody when you know you already got the, got the, the thing? 
And then when you come in, you'll say, oh, you know, I did this today, I did that today, and I did that. And, it's, and Alan says, wow, he's so righteous. He's such a giver. He's so awesome. Oh, man, I wish I could be like Joe or Johnny or Sally. And then all of a sudden, and then it says don't let the right hand know what the left hand's doing. And you don't want to expose your brother that's in need if God moves in your heart and your brother is lost his job and is in, struggling. And all of a sudden, oh, yeah, I had a bailout brother so-and-so. And everybody knows, oh, brother so-and-so's. And whatever you want to look at the scriptures, it's all in the Word. It says in the synagogues in the street, they blow a trumpet to have glory before men. I say to you, they have the reward. But do your alms and do not let your left hand know what your right hand's doing. So it says that don't let the brother and sister know what you're doing. That the alms done in secret, the Father will reward you openly. So that's, that's what Jesus said about alms. Now let's see about alms after Jesus died and resurrected. This will blow your mind. Blow your mind because I'm like, oh my goodness, God, you're really good. Acts 9, 36-37. Now we're in Joppa. A certain disciple, uh, disciple named Tabitha, which by interpretation was called Dorcas. So this was a, a, a girl in the church. Tabitha, by her name, the church is called Dorcas. Well, I'd rather keep the first name. <laughs> there was a lady I met, her name was Dorcas. I'm like, why don't you change it to Tabitha? I mean, to this day. Because, you know, you got Dork, Liner, and Dork. It's like Dorcas. But back then, you know, we didn't have one. This woman was full of good works. What was she full of? Not full of pride. She wasn't full of hypocrisy. She wasn't full of, but full of good works. So God probably rewarded her openly many times. <laughs> she was full of good works and alms deeds, which she did. And it did come to pass. So there's a lady that God is showing others and seeing now and and. and it came to pass those days that she was sick. So the Bible doesn't promise us not to get sick. Because you don't think you're going to give to God and save you from being sick. But your faith can keep you from being sick. You can not be sick if you believe you don't and you believe the blood or what. I don't know where you're at with your faith, but it doesn't... We don't give because that protects us. We give because we're commanded to give and we love people and we want to help. And we want to advance His kingdom. So she... End up, well, the enemy messed with the wrong girl because you can be the wrong guy or girl in this situation because it came to pass in those days that she was sick and she died. Well, most people say, in church state, a lot of, well, I mean, I can't. Well, they say, well, the good die young. Sometimes they do. But there's no not one good but him, our Heavenly Father in Heaven. So, she was sick and she died. And when she had washed, they laid her up in the upper chamber. And guess, and here comes Peter, without going through all the scriptures, Tabitha arise. So what? God sent his apostle to him. She died. But what was it that moved God? Because people were dying all the time. People only lived for like a little bit of time at that time. And, 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 and by that time, it wasn't, you know, like that time way back when they lived a long, long time. Because Peter's ministry was only, you know, it was... It wasn't. It was kind of like more like today, and let and even less people were dying. But God had moved God's heart, so they added the Bible for what a reason. These things are all in here for a reason. If we just oh well, that's just that's cool. No, what? It's why did they? Why they just? They could have just glorified the miracle. Here goes Peter, raising the dead. But they said for some reason about that, right? Let's see Acts 10 about alms. Alms is giving to the poor or helping those in need and that's basically what it is. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius and a centurion of the band called the Italian band, a devout man that feared God with all his house. So there's a Gentile that feared God with all of his house and gave much alms to the people. And pray to God always. 
So, wow. Okay, here we go. Pretty that always. So this guy was doing something, right? And how many know you can just be just doing something, doing something, and it just happens? It just happens. But if you keep doing something and doing something because you're expecting God to something to happen, then already your heart, you're already on deception because you're doing something with a hidden agenda. But God wants to get us to have a clean heart and a pure heart and a pure, clean mind and a pure mind that whatever we do, we do it because we're in His kingdom and we love Him. And, and it says in Psalm 66, whatever, I think verse 3 or I don't know, get in trouble if I say the wrong scripture, so i got to stop doing that. I knew this guy. He doesn't know the Bible. No, I don't know how the address, but I know the one that wrote it. So, you know. But it says that he loads us daily with benefits. Daily. Daily with benefits. So, all the answers are in there. And it's like, where are we with God? So he, this is so his son of Joppa called his Simon, whose surname was Peter, and lodged in the house, and Simon and Tanner by the seaside. Who, when he cometh, shall speak unto thee? Okay, I skipped the book, sorry. A devout man that feared God, okay. And he saw, okay, here it is. He saw in a vision, eventually about the ninth hour in the day, an angel of God coming to him and saying to him, Cornelius. So, this guy, a Gentile, in the Italian band, wasn't a Jew or nothing, it was a guy in the Italian band, was just living his day, and all of a sudden God says, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shake his world today. That's, I mean, why is it written here? To glorify Peter? No, we don't do nothing to the glory man. It's about God has a reason, and today he wants to break it open to us. It says, Saul, about the ninth hour, and the day the angel come to him, saying unto him, Cornelius. And when he lo looked on him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thy alms have come up to the Lord as a memorial. This is a guy that basically, how little or how long, he couldn't have been discipled long or whatever. And, you know, the book of Acts, it was right after the, I mean, and this guy is already, and God decided to visit him and do something for him. He was praying about probably his family, unsafe family. Doing whatever they were doing, but because his prayers and his alms together went up before God as a memorial, God can do anything he wants to do, whenever he wants to do. This guy wasn't giving because he wanted his family saved. It was his lifestyle. It was what he did all the time. Because if it was just one time, God's like, oh, you ain't going to play me. I'm not. And God knows everything we do, how we do it, our motives, why we do it. We've got to purify our motives. Acts. So then it goes to Acts. So in a vision, and God, the angel speaks in, let's go to Acts 31, jump to 31, do 34. And Cornelius, and thy prayers are heard, and thy alms have gotten a remembrance in the sight of God. And this job was called Simon, surnamed Peter, and lodged in the house, Simon the Tanner by the seaside, and said, He cometh and shall, so one will come and shall speak to you. Immediately then after he sent thee, and thou hast done well, everybody said well, well. <clears throat> that thou art come. Now therefore, that we are all present before God, and hear all these things that are commanded thee of God. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, The truth you perceive, that God is no respecter of person. What does that mean? <clears throat> he said, You receive this by truth, and God is no respecter of person. That doesn't mean, what he means is, you're a Gentile, you're an Italian man, you're a centurion, whatever you are, and God is no respect of persons. It's what you did in your life, what you did, God saw it in secret, and now He's rewarding you openly. And the whole town is going to see your whole family get saved and converted. And eventually, at the end of the day, God gets glorified and more people come to the kingdom. I mean, God has all His... God can have as many hidden agendas as He wants, but we can't. So... Whatever other agendas God had for it, but he moved on this man, he made a sign and wonder out of this family, and, and on top of it, saved the whole family. And every day we see scripture. Oh God, you said you're going to save our whole family be saved. That's not what the Bible says. When people prayed all the time, oh my whole household be saved. Oh really? Show me in the Bible where it says that. 
God say this person is because of this intercessor. This man of God, not only was he praying constantly, but he also had a heart for others. So, today was his day. That day was his day. Not only saved, but the Holy Ghost fell on all of them, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. In Acts 11, 11, it goes back the next chapter about it. It says, And behold, immediately there were three men already come unto the house, and there was sent from Caesar unto them, and, bo and bade me to go. Nothing doubted, more there were six accompanied. And he that entered the man's house and showed us how he had seen an angel, which stood and said unto him, and call for Simon, who is surnamed Peter, who shall tell you the words that their whole house shall be saved. So religion and you know naming and claiming people pray that all the time. They don't give alms. They don't do that. They pray that, and they pray their vain repetitious prayers about their own self. But this guy was praying for whatever he was praying moved God's heart, and his whole family got saved and came in the kingdom. But he did something, right? He got in a lifestyle with God. He got that whatever he was doing, it was coming up to God as a remember, and God was always remembering this one guy. You can move God's heart in the New Testament by what you do and what you don't do. Don't let anyone lie to you. And now let's see number five is sacrificial giving. And David longed and said, Oh, that one would give me a drink of water of the well of Bethlehem, which by the gate. And the mighty men broke through, and the host, the Philistines, drew water out of the well, and it was in the gate. So David was thirsty. Everybody say thirsty. thirsty. David was so thirsty, but he was radical dude, and he got that one cup of water. No, he did. He poured it out into the Lord. He poured it out unto the Lord, it says, by the gate, and he took it and brought it to David. Nevertheless, he would not drink it, but poured it unto the Lord. <clears throat> huh. And you call, money would call it that type of a waste, right? So let's see here when um, sacrificial giving Hopefully I didn't mess up my thing. I feel like something's on. So it says here the scripture about that. In the minute about blessed are those that consider the poor. The Lord will deliver them in time of trouble. The Lord will preserve them. This is uh, uh, after the, uh, the alms giving. And preserve him and keep him alive. He shall be blessed upon the earth. And that will deliver him from all his enemies. And the Lord will strengthen him upon his bed and lavish him that, and make all his bed. Uh, thou will make all his bed in thy Sick. In other words, heal him. Heal his body. Sacrifice. I just read that with, with David. And then let's look at this. Now let's look uh, at Elijah. Or Elisha, whatever it is. Which one it is. And the brook dried up. And these dried up. Sometimes God's got to dry some things up in our lives to get us to move to the next level or to the next place in the kingdom. Right? And he to get you to go do something. So he plants you to do something and the, and the book dried up. He was sent there and he said, and then he says in 1 Kings 17, 10 through 16. So he, then he arose because the brook dried up. And when he came to the gate of the city, there was a widow woman. So God sent him to this woman. She was gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, Fetch me the in, in a little water in a vessel that I might drink. And it was, see, his, the brook dried up. So he was now, God sent him to this woman, and her life had dried up too. Two people in need created a supernatural 
connection. And all of a sudden, let's look what happens. And bring to me and pay thee a morsel of bread for thine. And she said unto the Lord, give it thee. I have not cake, but a handful of meal in a, in a barrel and a little oil. And behold, I'm gathering two sticks that I may go and dress it that me and my son may eat. In other words, eat for the last time and then die because we got nothing left and see how long it is we're going to last till we die. We're destined. There's no one around. We ran out of everything we need to live. We have no man to help us. We got nothing. And there comes a guy telling him, give it to me. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, your, beer, your barrel shall not want, neither shall your cruise of oil fail. Unto the day the Lord sent rain upon the earth. So there was a famine. There was no rain. The book dried up. There was no rain. Bada, bada, bada. And she said, I, you're going to get supernatural increase in blessings. And you will not die. And your son will not die. But you got to give it your last sacrificial, last cake. <clears throat> how many knows how long they were probably waiting? Four or five days till they're starving to eat this last cake. And kind of like rationing and people doing different things when they're in diverse situations. Like when if like that movie with the things they were stuck in the mountain or the coal mining and they only had so much food and they were killing wanted to kill each other for the food and they had they lost their minds and basically they had to get order and they had to establish they had to believe on God and they had to believe God and God basically said, you know, and he came, he came through. Well this guy would look like a what I mean, I'm sure he's broke just right up, and he's walking, and he's, and what a selfish guy coming this this little boy and little girl and tell him to give it to him. See, if you went that and, and we did something, you would judge by your flesh or by your own mind. But God was setting this woman up to see where her heart was and see if she had faith in the man of God and faith in the words of God that came through him that she could receive what he was saying. The Bible says, receive a prophet, receive a prophet's reward. <clears throat> so today, if you don't receive this message, you're not going to receive anything that this message will, was, is, is set in to do. But if you receive it, and you believe it, you can have it. No matter where you are, and you have to believe. So she was like, well, what the heck? I'm going to die today or die tomorrow. I'm going to die anyway. I might as well put it in God's hands. And... So Elijah said unto her, Fear not, go and do thou what said, and make me therefore a little cake, and bring it to me, and after you make it, and for thy and thy son. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel. So he didn't say thus saith I. He said thus saith the Lord God of Israel. The barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall your cruise ever fail, oil fail, until the day that it rains on the earth. And she went and did according to... The saying of Elijah. So she obeyed the word of God. And she and her house did eat many days. Everybody say many days. Many days. That's a miracle. Mm -hmm. Supernatural miracle. And we can't even believe on a little miracle. <laughs> when God says something and he, he puts it in our heart and we believe it, it happens. It's and we need to believe that He's a miracle working God. He can do anything that He wants to do whenever He wants to do it. Something about this woman and this child moved Him that He <clears throat> brought His prophet there to bless that house. And everybody say they must have been doing something right and God had compassion on them. Okay, well, you can say it next week. <laughs> Either you guys are sleeping, but are you just in the Word really strong? So I believe it's the second one. Yes. Amen? Yes. Amen? This is the Bible. All I'm doing is reading the Bible. And that's what, in the last days, many will be stoned for reading the Bible. Not get stoned while they're reading the Bible. Be stoned for reading the Bible. Big difference. And the barrel of meal wasted not, and neither did the cruise of oil fail, according to the word of the Lord, which was spoken by Elijah. The word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. What if she said, no? That's our last little bit, you selfish prophet. 
Or, no, I'm not going to, what was she saying? I'm going to put me first. It's all about me. Me, my needs, my family, my children first. Well, she's, now you better put God first because he was setting you up to believe something. Let's see Mark, on sacrificial Mark 28, 31 in the New Testament. Then Peter began to say, I've left everything, Lord, and followed you. And Jesus answered and said, Verily I say unto you, there is no man that has left houses, brothers, sister, country, mother, father, wife, children, and lands for my sake and the gospels that shall not receive a hundredfold now in this time. But how many know everything needs to be activated by faith? You need to believe what Jesus says to have it. You can't just... Read the scripture like a Pharisee and a Sadducee or religiously and just say, oh, that was Peter. And, oh, that's great. That's nice. That happened great. You need to take it. You need to grab it. And you need to believe it. And if you're doing it for any wrong motives, God's probably not going to bless you anyway. If, but if you really want to advance His kingdom, if you really have His kingdom on your mind, God promises that whatever you give to Him, He will pour it back to you 100 fold in this time, but with persecution. Houses, brothers, mothers and children and lands with persecutions. In the world... In the world, in this world, and and in the age to come, in eternal life. Wow! So Jesus is building a mansion now, and God wants to bless you now. But it said it here. He said, "Whatever you give up." And how many know that was right averting when he told the told the rich young ruler? He said, "God, I've given you my ten percent. I've done this. I go to the temple every year. I do all this stuff. I've honored my father and mother." And that, and And Jesus said, "You lack this one thing. Sell everything." He said. In other words, you said, but you got an idol. Your things are your idol. So he said to him, sell all you have and give it to the poor and follow me. He went away sad. Why? Because he, the Bible says he had a great thing. He had lots of things. He could have went away happy that day because if he really would have known God and known that God would never ask something from me unless he wanted to give you a hundred times more. But see, God will try us and test us in our hearts constantly. Maybe you can stay at a 10 level, a 10% guy, or a, a, a person that treats the kingdom like a, um, a, a donation thing where they want to get their tax wrap and give when they feel like it, and the other one are just stick at 10% and not receiving any kind of supernatural blessings. Because it actually takes faith. Faith to move God and faith to move into the supernatural. So God... Always, he said, without faith, it is impossible to please him. So he sees your unbelief. He sees your fear of lack. He sees your fear of and all the things that you hear on TV and what's going to happen to the economy and the stock market's going to fall. All these things are probably going to happen. But he said, but I'm your God and I promised you the word. So are you believing this or are you going to believe me? So God says today again, it happens again and again and again. And we see it again. He says, and I'll give you eternal life, for the first shall be last, and the last shall be first. And then, let's see about honoring people in our lives. Elijah and the Shunammite woman fell on a day, uh, fell on a day, and Elijah passed through Shunem. And there was a great, a great woman, and she constrained him to eat bread. So she held him, hey, you've been coming through all the time. I perceive you're a prophet. I've heard about you. Come here to my house. And so it was, and as often as he passed by, he turned to eat bread. So she was feeding him all this time. She, and then basically she's saying, well, what more can we do for this man of God? And, it says, and she said to her husband, behold, I perceive that this is a holy man of God. He passes by us continually. Let us make a little room for him, a chamber, and, pay thee, and pray thee on a wall, and let us set for him a bed and a table and a stool and a candlestick that he may be and it shall be when he does come by he can turn in and rest here and it fell on a day that came thither and he turned into the chamber and lay there so then they did it he came through he took them up on their offer and but they did you see anywhere in there that they did that because they wanted something back no and then what did God do? Let's see what God did. Well, I know what He did because I, I read the Bible, so I'll just tell you because I've got so many scriptures here. I'll keep it short. 
God actually had him send his servant and go talk with them a while. See what they're needing. Go spend some time with them and come back and report to me because I'm gonna, God's going to bless them. So the servant came back and said, well, they were speaking of, always want, they wanted a child and they're of old age. And, <clears throat> and she had spoken about this and that. And then he sent the servant saying, go back. So he sent the word. He says, by this time next year, you will bore a child. So then he went back and he gave them that. Why? Because they didn't set a room up because they wanted a child. They did it because they love God and they want to honor his messengers and his prophets and apostles or whatever. So let's look here. And then what did God do? Again, that went up to him. Wow. Look at this. He's been coming by all these houses all the time. But this woman and man been feeding him bread. Now they're making a room for him. And God's like, you know what? I'm going to do give them something that they couldn't have in the natural blessing. Now look at Mark, and, and let's see um, honoring God in, in our life. Let's see Mar Martha, and even comes under uh, some sort of uh, sacrificial offering as well. Matthew 26, 7-13. There came in a woman, had an alabaster box of precious ointment, and poured it on his head. And he sat at meat, and his disciples saw it, and they got angry of indignation, saying, this is a waste. Happens in the church all the time. Well, we need to take care of the poor. This should be used for the poor. How could you dare receive that, Jesus? I thought you were so spiritual and you didn't want anything. Or I thought you were about the poor. And so Judas was stirring up all the other disciples to be judging Jesus on, on what he was being able to receive. And then he said this, with, to this purpose, this is a waste. For the ointment might have been sold for much and given to the poor. When Jesus understood what they said, and then, why trouble this woman? She had wrought a good work unto me. For the poor you'll have with you always, but for me, not always. For it said that she had poured this ointment on his body that it, for his burial. And what service gospels preach? For this woman, it will be moral for her. So how does she get blessed? How... I, Talk about a legacy. This woman, what she did to Jesus, not that people are looking at you. People say, oh, I'll write a book. What kind of legacy you want to leave on her? Oh, I want to be known. Like, you know, Mother Teresa was known. She left a legacy for, you know, living in a spirit of poverty. And God didn't want her to be poor. She got a lot of all that. So she got a reward a lot on earth, but she left a great legacy. This woman, but Mother Teresa won't be talked about by Jesus all the time. Because she had a lot of um, wrong mindsets and held up a lot of people. And, you know, God didn't want her to be poor. She didn't have to do all that and be poor. She could have done all that and had more. So, oh, she's so... So she got a reward because everybody knew what she was doing. She was a really good woman. She did a lot. I'm not trying to talk bad about her. But this woman left the legacy too, just like Mother Teresa. Oh, Eric, we're still, we just talked about today, we talked about last week, two, four weeks ago, and you know, down the church, they're talking about her. Well, I mean, this woman gets talked about all the time. And Jesus, Judas left the legacy too. He gets talked about all the time too. But you don't want to hear about that one. But this one, it was right. And what did she do? She gave all she had and she broke it at her feet. And that talks about the heart. What God is saying, I want all your heart. And all the other things will come with it. 2 Corinthians 9. For touching the ministers of the saints, plus uh, superfluous unto me, I write unto you. I say now the abundance, I write unto you. For I know the forwardness of thy mind, which I boast of you to do them in Macedonia, Archaea, and ready a year ago. For your zeal has provoked very many. Everybody say, your zeal... Zeal. Is, there is there to provoke others. others. Your zealous, zealous works, works, your zealous, your zealous behavior, behavior will, provoke will provoke others, and that's what God wants. Verse 2, Yet have I sent the brethren as boasting to you, should be in vain this belief that I said you may be ready. Lest happily I come 
with me and find you unprepared that you may say, Yea, should I be ashamed that I confident in boasting? Therefore, I thought it necessary to exhort and how many know that exhort means strongly charge somebody? Because in the NIV we always change the words and make the gospel a little weaker than it really is. No, brother, you're not supposed to come abruptly at your brother and sister because it says to um, come on to, to uh, that other word that they have. And then but when you translate it into the, what it was, you take that word of exhort, or um, and then you change it to edification, and then it just starts water, getting watered down. Exhort the brethren, they will go before you and wake up beforehand your bounty. Therefore you have noticed before that the same night you already the matter in the bounty of as of covenantness. But I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. Right there it is in a nutshell. And he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. But we don't believe God. Or well, well, he's a respected person. He'll do it for this one, but not for me. Well, then you're being deceived. As we just saw the word, it said over there that God's no respected person. We saw over there how what moves his heart all through the word, and we saw right here about what Paul is saying now about giving and purpose in your heart. Let him give, not grudgingly, not 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 a necessity. Don't give out of need. But God loves a cheerful giver. Don't give because I'm convincing you to give. Give because you love God, is what he's saying. And God is able to make grace abound toward you. <laughs> it's right here. That you always having all sufficiency, never lacking nothing. And, may, and, and be, be ready to every good work. Be ready to buy the plane tickets to go to the nations. Be ready to have this. Be ready to have all that. It's not that we, oh brother, we got to go on Facebook now and know why they're doing that because they don't have. They're not. They're in disobedience. Well, let's do a um, GoFundMe. GoFundMe tape. That's all the works of flesh. GoFundMe on Facebook because I here's my need. This is my mission. This is my vision. Will you partner with me? Well. He might get twenty dollars or a couple hundred, but you don't need that because God has everything you need if you're doing what He's asking. If you're us, so if you have a page like that, basically what you're saying is you haven't tapped into the kingdom. Since God is able to make grace abound towards you, that always sufficient in all things may abound in every good work. As is, is written, He has dispersed abroad and has given to the poor. And the righteous remain forever. His righteousness remains forever. Now, he that ministers seed to the sower, both minister bread and food, and multiply your seed sown. So we say, he that sows, he that ministers to the sower, both minister bread for your food, means he ministers also for you. So you, what you throw your bread on the water, and you got to say, God, is what is this for me? Or for you. But you gotta have something to be able to work with, and you gotta be sowing. And if you sow sparingly, if you only tithe, you're just gonna be in that level of mild obedience, never sowing seed in the ground where you can have a harvest. Because it says it here. And God did the trees and everything about the multiplication of the fruit was about giving. You put it in the ground and you wait and God gives the increase. You water it with your words. Speak faith over it. Believe. Come and shut down the enemy when he tells you oh, you're, you gave you're, all that you keep doing, your good works. But what does the Bible say? The Bible says, do not be weary in well-doing. At the proper time you will reap a harvest if you do not faint or give up. And I, I bet you so many people give up right before the harvest. Right before the harvest, they just say, oh, this isn't working for me. And then, boom, all of a sudden, they stop watering it and stop believing. And how many know, 
Even if you're about to have a harvest and you stop watering, it'll die. It'll dry up. So that's just something to think about. Being enriched in everything. Everything, not just a few things. This is New Testament. Bountifulness, which causes though, give us thanksgiving to God. For the administration of the service not only supplies the want of the saints, but in the abundant also by many thanksgivings unto God. While by the experiment of this ministration they glor glorify God to your profess subjection unto the gospel and for your liberal dis distribution unto them, your liberal distribution unto all men by their prayer for you, that which long after you the exceeding grace God in you. Thank be to God for the unspeakable gift. For if God gets a hold of our heart, He can get a hold of our wallet. We ought to exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees in all that we do. More than 10%, more the giving, the more the first fruits, the more the offering, the more, the more, the more. If you really want to see God really open up the windows of heaven in our lives. For I say unto you, and I say to everyone here, Father, we just ask you, Lord. We want to see your kingdom come and your will be done, Father, yeah. on earth as it is in heaven. We want to see, Father, your church coming together in truth and love, God. And we want to stop being greedy, stop being selfish, yeah. that we can actually be a well to the whole city, yeah. Yeah. a well that never runs dry, yeah. a well... Because it's about you and others, Father. In the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you, O oh God. We bless your holy name. We seal this word, O oh God. We thank you, Father, that you are so amazing, God. You are so awesome, God. And no matter what the enemy has in store for bad, God, you will turn it around for good, Father. Good, good, good. In the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah.